Before I get into it, I was going to do like a hand raising exercise to get a feel for kind of where people are at in their careers. Um, so if any of these apply to you, kind of throw your hand up and it'll give me some ratio. So does anyone here like work in someone else's business? You know, you work for the man or like traditional job. Okay. Uh, all right. Anyway, okay. Who in here is like um, what they would call like a, a independent freelancer? They work by themselves or maybe like a small group. Okay, a lot of you guys. All right, good. Um, how about people who um, are in like a larger group? Like maybe you own your own agency or you work within an agency. Okay, good to go. And did anyone like not raise their hand? No, most of you did. Almost okay. And that's good. Other. Um, we'll talk later. But so I think. Um, this is me, I'm, I'm, I'm Jason Coleman, and uh, I've been using WordPress for over a decade now. My first version was 1.5, um, and I, like most people back then, knew very little about WordPress and what it could do and, and kind of how to use it properly. Um, but we've learned that through the years. Um, our main product, and like what we do now, is Paid Memberships Pro, is a membership plugin. Um, and uh, Daniel touched on these. Building Web Apps with WordPress is a book for O'Reilly that I co-authored with um, Brian Messenlaner from Web Dev Studios. Um, and if you want to boost my ego and you're on Twitter, you could follow me at Jason underscore Coleman. Um, I like to see like a good like 30, 50 follower bump after a <laughs> word camp. That would be good. Um, so th this is like, you know, I'm going to tell my story. Um, and sometimes I use the word we. So if you hear me say we did this and we did that, what I'm really talking about is myself and my wife, Kimberly, who has been in the business with me forever. So I often, I do a lot of the talking and I get to take all the credit when I stand up here, but really she's over 50% of the business and how we get things done. Um, so that's what I mean, I mean by that. And then um, also like this is my story. I, I try to focus on like this is how I went from being a freelancer to doing products, but there's many different ways to do it. Um, so it's possible that this doesn't really apply to you, but I think everyone should kind of like be able to uh, pick up on the different key moments that we went through and relate to them. So at least some part of this um, will make sense to you, even if you're not a freelancer, although a lot of you are, which was good. Um, and so really quick, I'll try to breeze through this one because this is just so you know what the product is. Pay Merchants Pro is a membership plugin. It's used on over 40,000 sites. Um, according to the WordPress repo and our own tracking. Um, we have about 4,000 of those people using the site actually have paid us money at some point over the past five years, somewhere between 97 and $197 a year. Um, and now what people pay for is 197 for training, um, automatic updates of some of our add-ons and things like that. Uh, we're currently one full-time, that's myself, and then four part-time, including Kim, um, and like, what, four to, like four to six. Um, contractors, we're, we're definitely hiring, so um, you know, we're trying to boost that up and get more developers to um, take care of things and expand the business. So if you're a strong developer and you want to be part of the team, let me know afterwards. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, actually, before I go ahead, like, again, like this is so my story, so my product is a plugin. Like, it's a plugin for WordPress, but um, you could kind of at almost any point here think of a product as a book or a video series or a course or workshops or training. So it's kind of like if you're doing consulting where you, you work with someone and you help build stuff like on behalf of the client, um, there's a lot of different ways besides software to like build products. So I'm trying to keep that in mind if that happens to be something that you're interested in. Yeah. This is um, a uh, rough timeline of our freelancing to product career. Um, I spent a couple years working at Accenture, a big um, technology integration company. Um, you know, traveling and mostly just waiting for Kim to get out of college. Um, <laughs> and then um, in 2006, we, we uh, started our freelancing business together, doing like almost anything that had to do with the internet or applications. Um, uh, around 2008, we started focusing only on WordPress. So um, by that point, like almost all of our projects were WordPress projects. And we really like, you know, the, the intro for me said like we were trying to push the bounds of what WordPress could do. Um, this was like the early days of people using e-commerce on WordPress, and so we had a lot of custom apps that we had built ourselves for e-commerce sites to run directly inside of WordPress instead of through um, other apps at the time. Um, and uh, uh, around that time in 2010, we had this really great e-commerce plugin for a few of our clients, and uh, only like five people in the world were using it. And we, I went to a WordCamp. I think it was like WordCamp Philly around then, and I saw a bunch of people using this thing called WP e-commerce, which we had seen and totally thought was 
um, terrible at that time. That it, it didn't have as many features as others had. It didn't integrate with FedEx yet. It didn't, um, you know, support you know different kinds of products that ours could. Like ours was actually better. We had built something really good. But at the same time, like nobody knew about my plugin. Everyone knew about WP Commerce. Like it was running on tens of thousands of sites at that time, and the company behind it was making millions of dollars. And so I got this kind of jealousy, where I was like, "Oh, like my stuff is better. Like why isn't that me?" Um, so I really reflected about why isn't that me, right? Like, um, and part of that was that we had decided to only build that product for our clients, right? And we weren't thinking outside of you know the freelancing model. Everything we built was just to serve our clients and. So we changed our mindset when we developed a membership plugin to, hey, when we do this, let's really make it open source. Let's make it the community solution for memberships. Let's build it and get other people involved and get people using it for free and that kind of thing. Um, in the same vein as WP Commerce um, and you know, WordPress in general, right? So when we launched, we launched Paymasters Pro, and we'll get into this more, um, around 2010, 2011. And really last summer was when we relaunched Paymasters Pro um, as a product with um, some more payment options so people could pay us for a lot of stuff we previously were giving away for free. Um, and we flipped the switch from like 90% of our income coming from consulting engagements to over 90% now coming through Paymarchers Pro. So last year's goal was stop consulting, only do Paymarchers Pro, and we launched a product in the summer and it worked. We got money and um, now this is what we do, right? Um, this is the story. Oh, I keep seeing my notes here. So. Two more notes on this. Um, one is that this took quite a while, and I really think someone could speed it up. So this was my journey. There's a lot of you know, lag in there. And I think if you had the right kind of mentor or you're working in a, a good team, you could do it a little bit quicker than I did. And some people skip steps. So um, you could skip freelancing in general. Um, but like if you do, make sure that you, um, on the next slide, I start talking about freelancing. Um, that you replace, like we learned a lot of knowledge when we were freelancing, so if you skip this step, you gotta find some other way to learn about your customer base. Um, you made a lot of money freelancing, so if you're gonna build a product without freelancing, you need another source of money. Um, but freelancing is a really great way to kind of, like a training to build a products company, because you learn like business light. We learned how to start an LLC. We learned how to find a business accountant. Um, and file business taxes. We honed our skills as developers and designers. We, uh, we were our own boss and learned how to manage our time. I still remember what the first month of freelancing, I did not so much work, but Kim and I watched six whole seasons of Sopranos back to back to back <laughs> over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, and so you, you just realize like, oh man, if, if I don't have a boss breathing down my neck, how do I motivate myself to you know, um, get out of my pajamas or not and start working? Um, so these are things that, you know, if you're running any kind of business in general, but a product's one even, like, you gotta learn this to become a successful freelancer. Um, we also, kind of the next step for that is to become, you know, a consultant, a great consultant. Um, so the difference, in my opinion, between like a freelancer and a consultant is that oftentimes a freelancer is hired to do a specific thing and you deliver that specific thing and get paid for it. A consultant really should be working with the client to help them figure out what they want to be doing to begin with. Um, you know, maybe you don't even need a website. You should be spending your budget on you know, Google local pages. You know, I definitely started doing that at a certain point in my career with people. Like, you know, this actually isn't a good use of your money. Do this other thing. Um, so you know, that's kind of the growth that you have as you kind of hone your skills. Um, another thing that we do is uh, you go deeper, right? So we started focusing on only WordPress, um, specifically e-commerce and WordPress. And so when we're hired to do an e-commerce WordPress project, that's a lot narrower focus than just build anything on WordPress. And so we have deeper knowledge in this one space. We can charge more for it. Um, we can, you know, more likely to deliver on what we're promising. We get more respect from our customers, and we use that respect to be able to work with them and kind of push back and say, you really should be doing this. And they listen to us because we've done it before. Um, so that's kind of the growth from, like, you're just a hired hand freelancer to now you're actually a consultant who knows something about something in an industry um, and can make more money and kind of deliver more value for your customers. And it's, if you're thinking about product businesses, it's at this point when you really want to use that narrow focus to learn about your customers, right? Listen to them, learn about their industry. Um, you will, in the course of your working with them, like hear what 
their pain points are, right? So they just word pain points, right? Like what, what are they upset about? What do they wish was faster, or easier, or cheaper, or better? Um, you'll get to see, you'll be buying other plugins, you'll be buying plugins to use on those projects or other tools and software. Um, so you get to see what are they willing to pay their money on for and what are they not willing to pay money for um, as you're working with clients. So you want to like kind of actively and consciously keep your ears open in this phase. Um, it's really easy to just, here's another project, I'm going to work with them, get it done, and move on. But you want to like kind of try to slow down at certain points and uh, you know, keep your, your ears open to figure out, like look for those opportunities of what could be a product. <clears throat> and at some point while you're doing consulting, uh, you'll start building, or at least we did, we built free products. Um, or you'll take products, uh, things that you've built for one specific client and package them up for anyone to use, right? Or you're at least packaging them up for you to use again and again within your own projects. If you find yourself doing that, those are good candidates for like, let me release this to the world as like a plugin for WordPress or as something you know, that, that other people can use. So a, a great rule of thumb for this, um, which is kind of a surprise point for a lot of people at this stage, is that it typically takes at least two to five times more effort to take a piece of code that you've written for one client and make it general use. Um, so why is that? Like when you put a plugin in the WordPress repository, it has to run on every server type you know, every supported version of PHP. It has to run on Windows, like there's like 3%. We still get people saying, this doesn't run on Windows Server. And you say like, well, you should not use Windows Server for websites anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, so, but you do have to deal with that, right? Because if you don't take that into account, you know, not everyone's going to be able to use your plugin. Um, you also, like, when you're delivering for one client, we would often have like settings.php that have PHP variables of, of what, how you would set it up. Um, that's not going to fly in a plugin, right? You have to build a settings page with a GUI for people to choose the settings and kind of think about not just one specific use case, but kind of like a little bit, at least like how people might want to use this for slightly different things. Um, so all of that takes a lot of work. I remember um, like a WordCamp Philly, it was like November and I was doing a presentation. I was talking about Payments Pro and I was like, yeah, we have it finished and we'll have it out before the end of the year. And you know, it took like till June before we really had it ready to um, release to the wild, even though websites have been running it with under our command for over, almost a year at that point. Um, another, uh, another really important part of this is the free part, right? So, um, and there's other, in our case as consultants, we, we really weren't trying to make money on products at this point. We were trying to build clout for our consulting business. Um, if people see that you have a lot of popular downloads or maybe, you know, you're talking to them in the sales pitch for like, hey, we're going to build this thing for you and we'll do this and we'll use, um, you know, Pay Memberships Pro. And they're like, oh, like, you, you built that? Like, oh, I heard of that and I saw that. I, I stumbled upon that, right? So like, you're like, yeah, we actually built a plugin. They're like, well, I'll hire the people who built the plugin to implement it. Um, so that kind of stuff happens. You also, um, there's also a lot of overhead around selling something and supporting real paying customers. There's a lot of expectations when people are paying for something um, and you kind of deter you. So if you're like the, you, you, kind of, you can avoid that and just release something for free. So don't feel bad that like, you know, you're giving stuff away for free. There's, there's a lot of value you're still getting out of your products. Um, and you, one of the main points is that just to think of those products as enhancing your consulting business um, rather than thinking about selling them. Like it's, it's good, this is good training for just how do I build a product and release it like without the baggage of like the business around it. Um, another kind of key point at this is you want to try to keep these products simple, um, which was not necessarily something we do with Pay Memberships Pro. I'm, I'm often jealous of some plugins that like all they do is like a, you know, a pop up a, a little box in a certain place or they integrate with one service, you know, or like maybe like, you know, we build it, all it does is Stripe, 100% Stripe. And, you know, we start at the, the gate with like, here's a platform for any kind of membership site that integrates with 30 services and 10 different gateways. And so we really complicated it, um, uh, made it really hard. If we had a simpler product that we were backing at this stage, um, it, it kind of would have made things a lot easier. And then kind of one of the biggest things, and I'll try to repeat this a couple times from this point on, that you can take away from this point is to build an email list. Um, so the hack here is if you have a free download on your website, uh, people come and say, I want that. You say, first, give me your email address, and then you give them the download, right? Um, and even if it's in the WordPress repository, 
you ask for the email address on your website, and then you redirect them to the zip file in the WordPress repository. And this is kind of a trick we learned from WooCommerce was doing this. Um, and when we saw them do it, and we're like, that's a really good idea, and we switched it on, like we instantly were getting like 20 to 50 emails a day to our mailing list from people hitting our website. Um, and similar things you can kind of embed. There's like not, um, you can be, you don't have to be like spammy or, or overly marketing about like gathering people's email addresses. You can do it in a really kind way, like within your plugins too. Um, but that's really like you're giving away for free. You're gathering that email address. It's super valuable um, because you know the the model here is like you're going to give away a lot of stuff for free. You're going to help it to bolster your consulting company. And eventually, when you have something that you're pay, you're asking for money, you have that email list to market to. Um, so really quick. I touched on this a bit, but um, you know, we not only was it you know these free products that we were given away, they were open source, right? Um, WordPress is an open source platform, so developers are really going to embrace something that's fully open source. Um, a lot of people thinking of getting into products business um, have like a love hate relationship with the GPL license and the open source mentality. Um, they kind of like the parts that allow them to like use all this stuff for free and like build on the top of other people's code and they kind of don't like the part where it makes it possible for people to use your code for free um, if you're eventually trying to make money on it. Um, but in our case, and I think most people should, you, you really have to embrace, like this is the platform and that's the ideology behind like the software behind it. Um, you should embrace it 100% and we did. Um, you, this was one of the key lessons we learned about like w, uh, WP e-commerce at the time, and now WooCommerce is e-commerce. So like, but at the time, that was one that was working. Um, you know, what were we doing wrong? Like, oh, theirs was open source; their code was available, and they were interacting with developers, and like that's why they started getting growth in the community. Um, and it's important, you know, the, the earlier you put it out there on GitHub or you put your stuff out there, the earlier you're going to get other people involved, uh, developers to help, because eventually. You want it to be kind of bigger than yourself um, and, and have other people helping you out to maintain things. Charging. Um, so if you have these three part products, at some, part, at some point you're going to start charging. And um, one of the earliest ways, and I think a lot of people are in the same position where they have a really popular plugin that's available for free and they're supporting it maybe in the forums on the WordPress.org repository and it's taking up too much of their time. They're spending hours a day answering questions and emails around something they're not getting paid for. Um, and they can kind of justify it by saying, like, I get leads from this and I get business, but after a while, like, the money, like, it really doesn't justify the time you're spending. Um, and a lot of people in this situation will think, like, I can't, like, start charging for the product until I create, like, the premium version or until I create add-ons or I create something else that people should pay for. Um, and in our case, it worked really well at this stage, and it's really simple, is that you don't have to create a new product. You can just charge for support. Um, and there's some things to fight. The WordPress.org repository that allows you to support themes and plugins um, like gives a place for people to kind of ask for support for free. And so when you answer them and say, you have to pay, and we'll answer your question over here, like they get upset. Um, and so we're trying to work with some of the, the people in charge of those websites to make that, like if you want to have paid support, make it like an easier process for, these, for our kinds of companies to, to move it offline. But who knows how that happens. In the meantime, um, you'll have people complain about money, but you have to kind of get over that, right? And say that like, you just state your piece and say, this is the way it works. I'll answer these kinds of questions, these kinds of questions you have to pay for, and here's a fair price. Um, and I have lots of um, articles. If you search the Paid Memberships Pro blog for pricing, I have a a series of you know almost a dozen articles about how to come up with a good price. Uh, but in general, if you're charging for support, you want to figure out what your hourly rate is when you're doing consulting work and figure out how many hours it takes to support the average you know, support customer and you know, charge, you know, do that math and charge it. For us, it was $97 a year, roughly covered you know, about a half hour per customer who was um, paying for support. And it, you know, some people were we lost money on, and some people paid us $97 and we never talked to them, but it averaged out to that. Um, so yeah, so you can charge for support first, and our setup was really simple. It was Paid Memberships Pro to gather money, so feel free to use our plugin for free to gather money on your site. Um, and then BB Press as the support channel, uh, but there's other support channels that work. Um, and that's how we're doing. Again, like people were complaining about paying, and, and this is, this can kind of get you down or throw you off or confuse you, but in reality, like, people will always complain about paying. There will always be someone upset that they had to spend money. And kind of, no matter where you put that point, 
um, like they're going to be mad. So some plugins you have to pay up front, and then you know um, then you get support, and people will complain that they have to pay it all. But we give you, hey, all the software is free, and you just need like my time, half hour of my time, you have to pay for it, and they'll still be upset. Um, so you. And some people will want you know to pay monthly instead of annually, you know, and and you can't make all these people happy. You kind of just have to choose the pricing model that works for you and accept it, and accept that you're you're not going to make everyone happy. We'll we'll touch on that topic a lot in a little bit. Um, uh, another couple quick things here. Uh, so we also had a plan called the Do It For Me plan in the center there, where we did like mini installs for five hundred dollars, and this was a great opportunity to go hands on, get hands on with the customers using our product and learn. How are they really using it? What features do they need? What add-ons would be useful? Um, so at $500 for like five hours, I think it was, it was really like half. It was, it was a, a good deal for them of like what we're doing, but we considered it market research. Um, and so that was a good way to like get, gain hands on. And then um, at this point, like things were, were really good. We had this uh, system where there was a, a great lead gen funnel for our consulting business. And at the top, a lot of people using our plugin for free. And some percentage of them would pay us $97 for support that almost, you know, that $97 almost supported that time. And then some of those would pay us $500 for a mini engagement, like a service as a product. And then some percentage of those would hire us for larger projects or become ongoing consulting clients. Um, and so this was like a, a decent spot for us. Um, we were, you know, running a really good consulting business. And I think some people um, <clears throat> get to this point and they, Stay here, right? Um, and, we, and we thought about that. We were really comfortable. <laughs> um, you know, it, it definitely, this was kind of, there was like the, the longest time on that chart. It was about four years. We're like, this is good. Like, we have, a, we have a great house and a yard and two kids and a middle class lifestyle. And my family's trying to convince me to get a dog, but I'm slightly allergic, so I'm, I'm not up for it. But, <laughs> um, you know, and you have the thought, like, hey, let's just double our hourly rate on our consulting again, work half as much save for retirement and like coast out life. Like why, why do we have to grow bigger? Do we need a bigger company? And I think it's okay if people make the decision to stay there, right? Um, some people make another decision to build the consulting company, right? So if you're good at hiring strong people and training them to take over to work and integrate with clients, um, you can kind of grow. There's tons of consulting companies in the WordPress space that started out small and they hired and grew bigger and bigger. Um, so that's a path. But I know I realized that maybe if you're at this talk that um, that wasn't necessarily my skill set. It wasn't what I necessarily wanted to do with my business. We tried a little bit to grow a consulting company, saw some challenges we had to get through, and I just realized, like, I don't want to do this. Um, it's not, you know, what I want to do. Um, I want to focus on products and, and just one thing. Um, another issue at this point in time, and I think this is, was dealing with haters. Um, so... These, I, these are, I don't know if you can read them, but these are a couple of my favorite pieces of hate mail and hate reviews that we've gotten. <laughs> um, I tried to block out the names in the foul language, um, but I guess they're fun, so I'll go through them. The first one <laughs> is uh, a one-star review we had uh, that says, you know, we have vet poor customer service and that I don't care about this person. Um, I think he accuses me of having Asperger's. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, the background on that was that I had gotten like a giant three-page all-caps email from the same person I kind of cross-referenced some language he used. Um, and he said, like, oh, like, your plugin is dumb. It should be doing this thing one way. Or, like, you know, it, I, I've been I, 20 hours I spent, and I can't figure it out, and I'm not going to pay you for support, and you should pay me because I have a really good idea for you. And it was like a crazy email about all the things we did wrong and a couple things we should change. And you could just tell, like, I don't want to engage in this person um, there'll be such a time sink and it, it would be really bad for me. And I think I had like a one line reply that was like, it sounds like you're having a lot of trouble with Famous Pro. It might not be the plugin for you. Try another membership plugin. Like that was like all I said um, to try to move on. And that of course prompted like three more emails, all caps over the next few days where like they're just attacking me. And then I think I have a rule that sends this guy's email to trash. I don't know what happened, but he at some point decided to post this review. Um, and you'll, one thing you'll deal with, and this comes up all the time, at least once a week for me, and I, I see it, there's some plugins that were released this week that are having the same issue. Um, he says, my customer service was terrible, you know, um, and in some cases people accuse us, of, accuse us of this because we say, oh, I can help you with that. Come sign up on my site where I help people who pay me. Um, and they're like, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, you know, like, why would I do that? Um, you know, your customer service stinks. And then I'm like, you're not really my customer yet until you give me money. Like, you kind of don't understand how this works. 
uh, and we, we have, um, we have a 100% money back guarantee. It's a good idea to do that. So it's like you pay me, you don't like it, you get your money back. Um, but there, like I said, people are going to complain about money no matter what it is. And some people just don't want to, to pay you. And you have to kind of like move on. And, and sadly, you deal with like one star reviews. Like this really affects, um, if we dip like below four stars, we're getting close. Like, you know, people who search for membership are going to see that and kind of assume something. Um, and I could get into like, there's process for how to handle this stuff. Um, the other one, really quick, is it's funny. Like, we got this email, and um, I, I, I remembered him saying he was going to find me at my house and punch me in my face. But when I looked at it for this slide, he actually said he's going to tear my rear end off my face or something like that. So, I mean, it's kind of scary. And what, what's funny is we don't sell anything for $30. So I did a little research, and it wasn't even our product. It was something else. So it was like <laughs> mom and pop hosting. And I felt bad like saying it's actually these guys, because now he was going to go harass someone else. Uh, but these are, these are pretty bad, but we get stuff in this vein every single day, every single week. And um, like we're humans, so like when I wake up in the morning and I see that, like I'd be bummed all day, like terrible. Like, I'm like oh, I'm not making people happy, right? Um, and as a consultant, like you, you're, that's what you do, right? You make people happy. That's how you run your business. Is like your clients have to like, you know, feel the value and be happy with the work you do. You live off referrals for other clients, and in your consultant, like when we were consulting, we, we would get like two to three clients a month, like thirty at any one given time, um, and we would fire about one client every year. And half the time, they didn't even know we were firing them because. Internally, we would muffle the phone and be like, we're, yeah, we're going to stop working with these guys. <laughs> and then back on the phone, be like, oh, yeah, we're good. And we would do everything. You'd stop charging them. Like, I did all this stuff for you for free. I'm not going to charge you. And I did this other thing that we thought we couldn't do, but we did it. And you're in a good place. And you should, these guys could probably help you. And they would be better than us. We're going to, you know, we're not even in this space, blah, blah. And they would go off and they would be happy. Like, we made them happy, even though we fired them, right? And some we would really fire. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like a, it's, it's not that big of an occurrence and you can kind of overcome it just by being super nice. But when you get an email out of the blue that says, I'm going to punch you and whatever, like you can't be nice to that person. Um, you know, you're, when you go to hundreds of customers a month and thousands of people using uh, your products that never interact with you, like you don't have enough time in the day to even like, you know, reply to all of these or like address them. And the negativity can really get you down. And I see this in a lot of product companies and software as a service companies as they scale that like, the stuff that makes you so good at smaller scale that you care a lot like becomes uh, a liability. Um, so you have to figure out like how do you process this? And I think like therapy probably helps. Uh, <laughs> meditation can help, right? Because like you know your heart rate gets up reading that. Um, but uh, the process that I go through is do you like one you have to kind of step back and like really consider it, right? In this three pages of email, like maybe he has a point, and we should the setting should be a little more clear. Um, don't let him know that you're like, oh yeah, you know what, we're going to change the wording on that <laughs> or something like that. Like, is there positive, is there feedback that you can take out of it? Like, you got to kind of get uh, objective about it and see if there is. And then try to move on as, as, as quickly as possible, right? Um, don't focus on the people who don't want to pay you. Focus on the customers who do want to pay you. Focus on the positivity. Um, I think around the time we got this one-star review, we emailed our mailing list and said, if you're enjoying Paymarchers Pro, you know, we'd really appreciate it if you gave an honest review on WordPress.org. And then there was a flood of positive reviews. And it's like, focus on that stuff to kind of pick you up um, and try to ignore this stuff because it's going to be there. Um, you know, I, I, if you go to like uh, Verizon's Facebook page, there's like 10,000 times this, right? So like 20, literally tens of thousands of comments of people upset with them. So like every business is going to have this problem. And you, that's kind of a skill that, you know, isn't in many business books or like isn't in many WordPress WordCamp talks until this one, I guess. But like, you know, like, hey, you're going to have to deal with this um, if you're scaling something to a lot of users. Um, so I try to go really fast through this, but uh, like kind of uh, so I can get questions. I'm really interested in questions. Um, but last summer we were at an inflection point, and a lot of businesses, the same thing, they get at this inflection point. They're considering like maybe I should just stay here, but I, I, I want like a products business. Because I, you know, I want to focus on one thing. I want to be able to scale it. I really like that. I want to like, you know, impact people through the stuff that I'm, I'm delivering. Um, but you're making money consulting, right? So at some point, like you're going to have to give up the quote unquote easy money so you can get heads down and focus on your business. And in our case, it was, you know, we'd have to, you know, oh, we could sell that project like twenty thousand dollars a month for the next three months. That's nice money. That's awesome. Or like we let's tell them we don't have time to do it so that we can spend time 
you know, really releasing our products and doing the stuff you have to do to get over the hump to launch. Um, so this is kind of a common thing that comes up in these, in these businesses is you have to save up the money beforehand so that you can make that. It's a lot easier like when, when you're not living paycheck to paycheck or like month to month to turn away money like that. So you want to make sure that your life and you, you kind of is in the position where you can do that. Um, so that's something you have to do over time. And then also you just kind of have to have, you know, like you have to have the confidence to do that and know that, oh, like if this doesn't work in three months or like it doesn't work when we launch, like I, I you know, I, I can go back to consulting. It's okay. Um, I'll be able to get it. And we're just kind of delaying three months. Like it's no big deal. Um, so that was us last summer when we kind of stopped doing consulting work. And luckily for us, like we doubled our prices. We doubled the number of places we were asking for money. And like there was like no change at all. And we just quadrupled our income from Pay Merchants Pro. And we're like, great, now we can do this full time. Um, so in our case, it went really well. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll probably leave that. There's a lot of details to how we launched and how we priced. And I, I have slides and a lot of stuff, information on my website. If you read the blog about how we did that, I can answer questions. Uh, but if it didn't go well, right, we were kind of prepared to like go back to square one and like try again. Um, I think that that idea of launching a product, you know, we really launched Pay Merchants Pro in 2000. 11, right? Um, so we launched it again last summer. Um, if it failed like the week, like we had a, like a seven day email to launch it at a discount and get people to show up, like if like that didn't work, like they technically it didn't work or like our checkout system broke while we did it or something goofy happened, like, you know, like a lot of people get upset, but like you're just like, oh, just wait a couple weeks and then launch again. Like people will forget or they won't know or they won't care. They won't, you know, it's like, um, if you feel like you launched at a certain price and it didn't work, like just change your price and launch again. Um, so like you, you really gotta have this like experiment mentality um, can kind of help you not get too bummed out like if it doesn't work. Because um, we definitely launched other things in the past, you know, five years that weren't as successful as Pay Mattress Pro. Um, and, we, you know, we were able to stay focused. Um, so that's just kind of a skill you can get from that. And again, like to reiterate, we had a massive email list at this point. We had 22,000 people on our email list so that when we said, hey, we're going to start charging for this stuff here, you can get it for $47. It's going to be $200 in a week. Um, a large percentage of those 22,000 people, you know, gave us $47. Um, and that was a good infusion of money to make up for the consulting that we lost the past few months and like helped us like to get started on this next level of our business. Um, so this earlier you get your email list, the sooner you, you know, the better it's going to be. Any questions at this point? Thanks. How did you build up like an email list? And build up an email list? So in our case, um, uh, on our, the main driver was on our website, Pay Merchants Pro. The, uh, and, and here's a trick if you're building websites and you probably figure this out for consulting. Like your homepage should do one thing, right? And on our homepage, when you're logged out, the one thing is to get you to sign up to you know, buy or download the product. So if you, you click the one giant button in the middle of the page, it asks for your email address and a password. It would create an account and save the email address, right, to MailChimp. We use, we use all our software, right? So Pay Merchants Pro. To, you can use it for free accounts too, and it links to MailChimp through an add-on we have with MailChimp, and so that email address will go to a MailChimp mailing list when people signed up. Maybe a better question is like, did you were you like we need to get our list up to this amount before we get launch ready? I um I think it's really tough to have like specific number goals because every industry, every niche, will kind of be a little different. Um, it also, you, um. In the beginning, like it was really slow in the beginning, right? Um, now we get five, like 50 to 100, excuse, excuse me, new emails a day. Um, back then, we were, you know, we were getting only a, a fraction of that when we first started, and before we figured out like how to kind of optimize yeah. asking people for emails. So I think an exact number doesn't matter, but like I think um, you have to do it like in every capacity, like and on your blog at, at the bottom of every blog, and kind of like really think about that stuff. Um, to start getting them as soon as possible. And then kind of just trust your system, right? And like keep putting free content out there, or good content, or um, you know, in the repository, people are using the plugin. That's like how we gain exposure. So, and then as long as your email system is set up, you'll start collecting them as you get more traffic to your website, I think. Did you do any paid traffic uh, to gain uh, email addresses or exposure? Yeah, um, not really. We experimented with like Google AdWords um, and we couldn't get, we, we didn't do it, well, no, I guess we did get free signups. Um, and I don't remember what we were, it was not great. We weren't good at that. Um, so I think it came out to almost like $10 an email address, which, which wasn't worth it. Um, like a dollar is pretty good. Like if we get 100 free users, we get like one paid, you know, 97 to 197 user out of it. Um, so this was all organic? Yeah, yeah. And the people 
finding the plugin in the repository when they search for membership. The, the word of mouth, as more people started using it and developers started supporting it, um, people like Chris Lemma who would write us up on their blog and review it and things like that. So it took a few years until like, people were like, oh, if you're going to... The other thing was that like, we were competing against mostly paid membership plugins, so the fact that ours was free and 100% open source really like, made it um, attractive to, to uh, developers. and so. But oh yeah, we had paid traffic. It didn't really work out for us. I I hear a lot of people find like fa get a lot of success out of Facebook ads right now. It's kind of the, so if you can find someone who's like a guru on doing Facebook ads, it seems like you can highly target them, retargeting um, using that. Those are good ways I hear, and those are things that I would experiment with currently. Um, but we've been lucky that it's been all organic. I think you had a question. Yes. Uh, how would you advise me on deciding what product to sell to? Right. Entrepreneurs? How, how right. I think what um, the general advice I would give is to like figure out a good niche or industry or community first, right? Um, it should be something you're already passionate about. Like it, that would be a plus. Um, and like get into that community. And if you're doing consulting work or freelance work now, they might be the people you're working with. And like I said, like keep your ears open. Like you should throughout the course of working with them be like, oh, here are other things they're paying for. Here's something they paid for, but they hated the way it worked. Here is, you know, um, stuff they're complaining about. And it's really a mindset to just keep your ears open for that. A really good resource to figure out that specific piece is um, there's a podcast called Stacking the Bricks. And it's run by a couple people, Alex um, Hillman and uh, I forget the woman's name. But they have a course called 30 by 500, which is really all about how do you figure out an idea for a product and then market it and launch it. It has some really good stuff, and they focus a lot on that, like, how do I build an idea phase Amy of things. Hoy. Amy Hoy, that, uh, Amy, Amy Hoy, that's right, Amy Hoy. But what, what did you just say? Amy Hoy, Amy H-O-Y is the, um, the woman behind that. So if you search for any of their names or their podcasts or a 30 by 500, 30 x 500, that's a really good resource on product stuff. Okay. Yeah. Very attractive for people that were paying. It suddenly was something that's free, and so it was able yeah. to attract other developers. I currently have a um, a WordPress membership site that's targeted to Chick Fil A operators. Okay. So it's very sure. Targeted. Yeah. So it's actually using Paid Membership Pro. Great. Uh, it's a software as a service that allows them to manage their team more effectively. Yeah. Allows their team members to request off. Yeah. How how can you transition? Because I don't have what I built is not uh, a plugin. Right. So yeah, it's, it's a service that I can just make open source. How do I attract? Yeah, and I think to help you know expand it. How, yeah, it attract developers for that. Do I have? It? No, not yeah. Oh, I'm I'm kind of restating the question for my own purpose. Um, so I think you're asking like you have a product that's a software as a service in a sense. Um, and you can't just like give away code, right? Or uh, there's not, there's not it's more of a service than more of a service code. Than and so, how, how do you attract developers? A dozen plugins that have all been integrated and set up a certain way. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. I like. I guess one point I would make is that like the freemium model doesn't work for every product, um, and maybe yours is a product where it doesn't. Um, I think it's good if you're a freelancer to focus on those kind of products that you can give away for free, even if you don't ever intend to charge for them because it's like practice building something and releasing it at all. Um, and like focus on building your consulting while you hone your skills in that set. Um, but if you do have a kind of product where um, you pay first, um, there's, and, and like I said, this is like the one path we did for our part. There's other models where you get you know, your clients to pay for I'm one thing. I'm Yeah. The, yeah, we uh, we had someone who did something similar for Dunkin' Donuts using our software. Like they had something else. Yeah. And like, so I guess how did you? Why did you? Is someone paying you to build it already, or like I don't? Um, no, I'm friends with a Chick Fil A operator in Marietta. Oh, he uses it just for his. Right. Yeah. He approached me and to develop something for his location, and I thought, well, but if he can use it for his store, why can't yeah. other stores use it? So yeah. I ended up creating as a WordPress multi-site setup. 
opening word for uh, Angel Lucas Pro and a number of other plugins? You, yeah, I mean, something that might work for that is if you could just um, eat up the cost for now and get a few stores using it. Oh, then, then go to Chick-fil-A and get them to pay for it, right? Well, see, the challenge is if I make it free now, then everybody that's paid for it now, I'd either have to refund. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's a price. That comes up. Um, it's definitely easier to raise prices than the lower prices because um, people get upset that they paid for something that's now free. Um, that's pretty tough. Do you, do you have a response or you have a new question? Yeah. Yeah. So you think uh oh. only for Chick-fil-A McDonald's the first Yeah, exactly. In fact when when I registered when I initially set it up, I registered a domain name C F A C which was surprisingly available. Uh, yeah. I think let's let's talk tonight at the after party and maybe we'll figure out a business plan for you. You're in a tricky tricky spot. Yeah. So I can't really. Uh, yeah. I think and it's well positioned. Yeah. Grow, but I need I need some developers to come on board. Oh, okay. To help me develop it further. Yeah. You grow. you have like the chicken and egg. You have to get money so that you can hire developers. Um, I think that sounds like the kind of thing that you're not gonna organically get developers to use because that. Right. It, no, at least not Chick Fil A restaurants are not a big buyer of freelance web development. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I make twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year off of it, just on the side, and not even promoting it. We should no. We I think you have like something that has proven traction because some people are paying for it. So you really now it's a yeah, step where you figure out how to turn it into a business. The only reason I'm yeah. signing up for it now, other operators. Is yeah. Now. Okay. Is he the marketing guy? Uh, okay. <laughs> is there people in this room? Developers. Need a marketing guy. <laughs> Developers. <laughs> Are there other? Oh. Uh, other? Did you have your hand up in the? Yeah, that's uh, what I was going to say. I was oh. like, it sounds to me like he needs a, vert, a, a, a vertical marketing rep rather than a developer rep. Though, oh, okay. Though, you know, two vertical markets away from needing five developers to manage everything is where you are right now. Yeah. So, really, if you could just find someone that could talk to hey, Yeah. Yeah. Specific yeah. Are, and and I, I know that there's a absolutely a need for it because the corporate Chick Fil A is very slow in rolling things out. Yeah. And they don't currently provide their operators with some of these basic tools like team member communication and website. You know, I've got a system that they can use WordPress to publish blog posts and it automatically gets emailed out to their team members. Awesome. Yeah. And I. Yeah, but were there other questions? I want to respect the time, but. No, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, a comment for him? Do you have a question for him? Yeah. This might be the last one. Are you less hours a day now than when you were consulting? What's that? Are you working less hours a day now than when you were consulting? Um, you know, I don't track it as heavily because I don't charge it. That's a really good question. Um, Free time or travel time? I, money I, in the bank? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Like one, <laughs> We're, we're, making, we're finally making more money. There definitely was a period where we were giving up a lot of really juicy consulting work to work on this thing we were giving away for free. So I have a blog post where I show like our income and it like dips and it's like, well, this is hard. Like, can we keep doing this? Um, but, but this year is probably going to be better than last year for sure. Um, Time-wise, I think I probably work week to week as much time. But one thing I have noticed, and this should improve over time, is like I went away on vacation for a week. And it was much easier to like hand off to my support team and say, do your best. I'll see you in a week. Um, and they kind of did their best, and some people had to wait, like if they had a really tough issue for the following week for me to get back, and that was kind of a little bit hard for them, but okay, right? Or maybe someone we had to refund $200. Um, in my consulting world, where I juggled 30 clients at any one time, like on any given day, one of them has an emergency that they absolutely expect me to work after hours on, so I don't have that. So, th and that was actually a primary factor for me wanting to move in the products, was like that stress of like, yeah, oh yeah, my, 
My work time is more structured. Like our team, we work, yeah. So it's more structured. And I sleep, I'm, I'm not up at night. Oh. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, that's like a, that's a little bit of a myth. Like, you gotta work for it. But, but I mean, there are parts to, like that. Like, um, we definitely work on the engine that gives us money, but we definitely, like, money comes to us and we didn't directly do anything for it. You know, we, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, oh, like, oh, here's, like, someone bought my thing. Money comes to us, but we didn't Right, yeah. But, um, and I mean, that's, yeah, the allure. I think, yeah, I, I, I definitely, you know, I don't know how long it would last if I disappeared forever, but, um, so you definitely have to keep working, but I can go away for a week and it was fine, you know, that kind of a thing was good. So how more. much, or what's the percentage that you get from add-ons to the product versus just the product itself? Or is that, or do you sell the add-ons at yeah. individually or is it just the bundle? We sell them like a bundle. So, um, and by the way, I would give like absolute numbers and ask me in the hall. Like, I'm I'm open. They're on my blog anyway. But um, our model is uh, so the the base plugin is free. A bunch of the add-ons are free. Some we ask you for 197 to download it from our site or to get automatic updates. And it's one bundle for all the add-ons. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit modeled after Gravity Forms, which does some similar. You pay one price for just the core plugin and all the bundle add-ons are together. Um, a lot of plugins do like you know EDD and WooCommerce charge individually for plugin add-ons, or you can bundle them together. There's pros and cons to both model, um, and I think like EDD Pippin probably regrets some things around that model. Um, but one thing that's good when you have individually priced add-ons, and what we're struggling with is there's another third-party developer who's supporting that because they get like a kickback for sales. Like that's the typical model. If it sells for forty dollars, half the money goes to the person who built it that isn't necessarily me. And so if we had a system like that earlier, we definitely would have had more developer involvement in our plugin. Because I, I know personally I've done it, like where I've developed a Braintree plugin for Jigo Shop, or I, I did it for a client, and then I built it up that two to five times more work to release it to Jigo Shop, and I wouldn't have done it if they didn't have a system to pay me back. Like, it didn't pay me back well. Like, that's bad, you know, then WooCommerce came out and whatever, that was a bad thing to do. But um, yeah, so I got involved, and other developers will get involved if you have a way to kind of work that out. And it, it is a, um, for me, I, my challenge for me is like if someone builds an add-on for Payrushers Pro, it's like, oh, like do you sell it on your own website? Are you making it free? Do you give it to us and then we put it in our bundle? Like, and like, should I pay you one time for it? Or like, I can't give you like a recurring fee because like we don't track it that way. So we're figuring that out because we had this system of like giving them all away or charging just for our bundle. Um, you have other problems if you sell them individually. What happens is, oh, here's a really good feature. If I put it in the core plugin, I don't make any money. But if I put it in an add-on, I get forty dollars an add-on for it. And so you have this like conflict of interest of like where the code goes. Or like this add-on's awesome, and actually everyone uses it. It should just be a core feature. But like, are you going to take that away from a developer and just put it in core? So you have those struggles. So we kind of give up one set of problems for another. It's um, I don't know if there's a right answer, but okay. that's what we chose. I guess ten more minutes to four. I don't know when I'm technically supposed to stop. But if you guys have questions, I'll keep going until they kick me out. Yeah. So. I Okay. Does it take, may take six months to add this stuff on? How yeah. do you manage like, developing the right area so that when you do future development? Right, yeah. Um, I could do better, but I'll tell you what I do now. Um, like, there's a couple things we, we do that I think are smart. Um, we, I mean, one thing is, I think, not to get too religious about like, f like a list of features. Um, you, uh, we do like in, peop, incoming stuff comes it comes in by email or people chat, um, and we kind of oh I'll take note and maybe you file it somewhere, but there's not like a magic list. But what really happens is if it is important enough, like you'll hear it so much that you're like oh I better do this. Um, so like if you just rely on the list in your head and the fact that like people are, that, like that's a good way to gauge like what features you should be focusing on. Um, we have like a Trello board. Trello is like a, a tool that you can use. And so like the ones that we kind of decide, yes, we are going to start talking about planning this, go into one column. And as we actually start developing them, we move them to another column. Um, so we kind of track it that way. Um, we, yeah, uh, when we, uh, we, we had goals. One thing I, I do less of now is like actually saying, hey, by the end of this year, I'm going to have multiple membership users per level, which is something I levels per user, which I promised a couple years ago and then decided it was a bad idea. Because people are like, oh, when is that? Or like, you said you would have it. And like, software development in particular, the way this works integrates with everything, is like, it's an unknown, right? So as we dug into that, we were like, oh, this is actually really hard. So we're not going to do it. Like, it, you know, I would have, I would, you know, spend all my money on my business to do this one feature, even though it like would be useful and people want it. 
you know, we had to make that decision. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, the other thing is we, we have like 80 plus add-ons now. Um, and like I said, we like, it's a complicated plugin and it would have been nice to be simple. In that phase when we were doing do it for me's, a lot of our add-ons came out of that where we installed it for someone and he was like, you know what, it'd be really nice if it integrated with this other plugin. I was like, oh cool, we'll spend some time to make this. Um, so that was a really good way to get ideas, but we might have gone too far sometimes where we did that so many times that when you create an add-on, like now you have to support it. And now when you build something else, it also has to work with the add-on, right? So that's kind of like my day-to-day -day job is when new features and bug fixes bumble up, I have to make sure they don't break everything else and it's kind of a lot to manage. And if we had like a more narrow focus, um, it might be easier to manage, but I know that's a decision you have to make. I hope that answers a little bit. We can question yeah. How then do you manage regression testing and making sure that new changes and new bug fixes? Yeah, not well. I need like a unit test guru to like really um, help us there because we don't do it well or, or enough. Um, we, we have a kind of ad hoc. We have some like, um, you know, manual spreadsheet tests that we go through and look for things, but it, it isn't good enough and we're not, yeah, we got to do that better. But it, that, that would be an awesome idea because that would help a lot with a lot of the dependency issues that come up between the add-ons. I wish I was doing, that's not like a focus of what we're doing now to get better at that. Is that all? All right, thanks guys.